History Science Theater 3000, show 502, real one. We're going to fight. We're going to finally discuss this. Uh, dare, I'm not going to say travesty. I'm just going to say this average Oscars show where everything literally happened how it was going to happen. I'm going to say Oscars so white because a total of two black people won Oscars. Everybody else was whiter than a sheet in that, in that thing. Um, I would say that I was really surprised that a couple of my predictions came true. I did not think that uh, Emma Stone was going to win. I thought we were going to go with Lily. Even like, my mother-in-law was, um, from what I understand, my, my wife told me because they were talking about it. She was a little bit surprised that Emma won because she thought Lily should get it. And I'm like, all she did was sit and sweat and be angry for three and a half hours. That's not a performance. But Emma running around like a lunatic and getting screwed 70 different ways in that movie, she got the Oscar. That's why. No, I agree. She had a lot more to do in that movie. We and you had our little discussion. It's just that, you know, dude, they were splitting the awards down the middle. I think that was the closest race this year was Emma Stone and uh, Lily Gladstone. It was a I very close look. race between those two. I got to look at these well, nominees. Lily Glad like Lily Gladstone got the, um, what did she get? She got the SAG. <coughs> I know that much. Uh yeah. What is it? The Golden Globe, Lily Gladstone got the Golden Globe. But then again, I think she may have split the difference with Emma Stone because, you know, there's two different acting categories. Mm -hmm. So that she probably split the difference there. Um, and then I'm trying to think what's the other. There's another big one. Like said, you got the SAG. You've got the oh, the BAFTA. Yeah, I think it was Emma Stone got the BAFTA. British Academy. Yeah. 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 Well, they well, best actress. But well, we might as well start there. Um, yeah. So you have. You have Emma in Poor Things, which is getting a lot of notice now. It's getting a lot of buzz because it's kind of controversial. I, I didn't pick up well, on this finally before. On streaming is what it is, and now people can finally see the damn thing. I've watched it twice, and I honestly yeah, don't know I, what you... I, I think it only got like a perfunctory release even here in New York. And, you know, it's an art theater kind of a thing, and you're seeing fewer art theaters out there. Yeah, agreed. You don't see too many of those. We had one, but it's gone now, of course. Still mm. stands, but it's gone. Right. And and the other nominees, uh, there are only two other nominees uh, that I'm not aware of. Annette Benning as uh, Nyad and uh, in the movie Nyad. Don't know anything about that movie. Is it about a swimmer or something? Is that what that is? Some kind of an athlete, some kind of a female athlete? Yeah, some, something like that. She, oh, because you know, you know what she did? Because she swam, she swam an ocean without getting attacked by sharks. Oh, <laughs> wait, so she didn't get attacked by sharks. All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It seems was to me it'd be more she interesting. Was a, she was a distant swimmer or something like that. It, how about this? A movie that's not in my wheelhouse. OK, I'll say that much. I, there was a um, movie. Oh, there was a movie about a surfer, a surfer girl who was attacked by a shark and lost her yeah, arm. Soul, surf, soul surfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like a Christian or something. So it's like a kind of a religious inspirational movie like that. Uh, and then the other one is Sandra Holler, who also was in. Zone of interest, and um, she's a really a fine actress. You know, she didn't. I don't think she got anything for that. But little, it's uh, interesting. This tangent. was the year of Sandra Huller, but she didn't win. Little tangent there for you. At least you should be happy that Zone of Interest got Best International Feature this year. I was, but I was not. I like many people. I was outraged. I guess if you want to put it that way, by Jonathan Glazer's speech. He doesn't seem to understand what his own movie was about because he goes around he start, he's first he says he refutes we stand here and we refute our Jew, jewishness and i'm like oh my god are you really saying this this is the academy which is like 80 percent jews so i wonder i wonder there now I'm, I'm looking and i'm seeing all these articles that are popping up outrage outrage quote unquote i'm not i'm not really outraged i'm just sort of like why did you have to do that you don't have to do that the academy awards should not be the stupid platform for speeches. I'm so tired of it. It should be entertaining people, you know. I have to blame Brando for that one when he won The Godfather. He sent that fake Indian chick up there to accept his award and make white Native people American, bad. Native American, Native <laughs> American. Well, if she's fake and digit. She wasn't even real. Her name was Sashi Little Indigenous Little she was Native actress. American, fine, but you know, hey, point is we can't say Indian anymore. You know? I don't want to get in trouble. Not. She's fake. She was fake. It doesn't even matter. Um. And then I, when Richard Pryor, not, I'm sorry, not Richard Pryor. That's a Eddie good Murphy. Eddie Murphy. No, no, no. I was thinking about Richard Gere. Richard Gere came up and said something about Tibetan 
people being tortured. Let's all send our positive vibes east. And I was like, come on, Richard, get off the stage. Anyway. Uh, also, tell, also tell him to take the gerbil out of his ass. Get the gerbil out. <laughs> you know, I never see him push back on that one. <laughs> anyway, and that's years. We're talking decades. Um, so, yeah, I was a little bit, I was a little disappointed in Glazer because he is a very talented director, but but doing that was just wow. Don't don't start comparing. He's he's like comparing Jews to Nazis apparently. Or See, something. At, at least the guy who won for the you know the uh, the documentary feature, he at least had something positive to say about Ukraine. His speech was. I love how he said he goes. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I didn't win an Oscar. I'd trade it for you know all the ending of the war in Ukraine. In his case, he gets a pass because he actually talked about a you know, a very relevant social issue. And his film was basically about that. You know what I'm thinking? Um, I, I don't want to go off on a political tangent here, but I was, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the fact that I don't think I take any side. I, you know what? I take the side of peace. I'm not into yeah. war. I don't, I don't want war. I don't want any more war. We have problems in this country. It's time to look inward. And I mean, like it's, it's like, you know, there's a half a million homeless people. We're letting immigrants in. We're t we're giving immigrants all the resources we should be giving Americans. Uh, taxpayers are footing the bill. There are a lot of problems going on right here. There's a lot of division that's being created. I don't like that either. You know, I mean, it's just. I think that's what we should be focusing on. We shouldn't be focusing on war and 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 the manufacturing of war and the manufacturing of hate and and bombs and missiles and all that stuff. And I'm maybe I'm just turning into a, you know. A, a cantankerous so you turn in a new cantankerous old hippie. I know. Well, old men in my in my day, old men were all about war. Go to war, kill them all, blow them out of the sand. That's what old men always talked about back in the day. I love that line from like that line from. <coughs> what we need is another war. <laughs> I was well. We were watching the movie Woodstock. Uh, you know the Michael Wadley's documentary from. Yeah. 1970 or so and we were watching it like two weeks ago and everybody was like war no war man peace on all this you know and don't take the brown acid you know all that stuff and i was thinking yeah i mean that's that's the way to go otherwise we're all gonna die we're all gonna die and we're all gonna die in in swamps of heat, hate and that's just all of it but that's the end of the speech anyway back to the oscars that's the, that's the end of that back to that so well, like we said about the best act actress category, you, we, I guess we were both happy at the end of the day that Emma Stone got it because she actually kind she of did the most it. work. Did they? Yeah, Let's she did the that. most work. <laughs> she did the most work. Uh, Killian, and when we get when Killian Murphy, I was going to say that was kind of I was, you know what, it was looking kind of close for Paul Giamatti there, but then when Killian started getting the big awards at the end of the year, like he got the SAG, he got the BAFTA, and all that stuff. So I think he got the BAFTA. At least I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I, I'm, all, I'm, I'm pretty sure he did. I have no doubt that he probably did because they love him over there. But um, but for me, I mean, like, it's not his greatest performance. His greatest performance, you know what his greatest performance probably was? I didn't mention this in the previous thing because I forgot about it, but it was a movie called Breakfast on Pluto where he basically played a drag queen. And it was from 2005 or 2006. And I remember it because it was the last movie that me and my wife watched before she had to go to the hospital and give birth to our daughter. So, I mean, like, I put something on because we were waiting. We were supposed to, because we had an appointment because the doctors had scheduled a C-section, of course, because they never want to have natural childbirth anymore because they're scared to death. So we we put on Breakfast on Pluto, and it was like, it was such a great, he plays a drag, it, it's, I think Neil Jordan directed it, right? And he plays a drag queen mm. that is an IRA sympathizer. So he helps the IRA out with their bombing and their campaigns and all that stuff. But he also happens to be a drag queen, so nobody takes him seriously. Anyway, it was a fantastic performance. That's something he probably should have gotten an Oscar for a long time ago. But as we say, it Neil feels Jordan like... Neil movies always get overlooked, though. They do. I think the only one I can think of that got anything was The Crying Game, right? Yeah, literally The Crying Game. That was it. Oh, well, uh, you know, maybe I think, you know what? I think he did get one more nomination somewhere down down the pipeline, but it was for something obscure. I don't even remember what it was. You know, let me look it up very quickly. I also want to mention that I, one I, of them. I, I think, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not misquoting myself either. Awards and nominations. He was nominated for, he was nominated for Mona Lisa, which was an earlier film. He was, there were two nominations yeah. for with The Vampire, but those were technical probably. Michael Collins got two nominations. Uh, the end of the affair got two nominations. So he 
he's only won the one for crying game, but he got he has a lot of BAFTA nominations and five wins and and uh, fifteen Golden Globe nominations as well. Um, Breakfast on Pluto, nothing except one nomination. Breakfast uh, Breakfast on Pluto got one nomination for for Killian Murphy for a Golden there Globe. There you go. And Irish Film and Television Awards, of course, love the movie, too. Oh, Ruth Negga, I forgot she was in it, too. I forgot that Ruth Negga was in it. Um, she's a favorite of mine. I, I kind of love her. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, well, you know, she was uh, she was in that Preacher show on AMC, but that's not the best of her acting. She's been on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and she was also in the movie World War Z, toward the end, the best okay. part, with Peter Capaldi. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, moving moving on here. Yeah, we were talking about best actor. Uh, we kind of knew Bradley wasn't going to get it. Um, now, oh, oh, yeah, I did want to mention Coleman Domingo. Okay, I never saw Rustin, but I do know I do know who Bayard Rustin is because I went to Bayard Rustin High School for the Humanities in Chelsea, in New York, finishing up my high school education in New York. So okay. my school was named after him. Um, and then of course you know Paul Giamatti. He's always good. He's probably one of these been, days he's going to get an Oscar. One of these days he will. It's just he needs. He'll get the honorary Robert Downey thing for something that, you know, he probably wasn't as great in, you know, because Robert Downey, for me, I think I think that's the culmination of his work because he's always been a great actor. I really I didn't. You know, that's another thing about Kimmel. I really. Why, why is Kimmel bringing up his past? Like like that's a joke or something like that's material for a joke. And I could see Downey was getting a little bit, you know, huh? A little and perturbed. I think maybe they were setting up his little speech because they knew he was going to win. And, you know, he gets up there and he talks about how his wife is like, you know, his the reason he's alive, which is nice. It's good to hear. But Downey is always good. I've never seen him turn in a lazy performance. I've never turned, seen him turn in just effortless. I, I, I was waiting for you to say... uh the only bad movie we could honestly say he's ever been in was probably Doolittle. Yeah, but he was good. It doesn't really matter. I mean, like, he was good. I saw, yeah, I remember seeing Doolittle, and I was like, eh, 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 eh. but he was good. He's good in everything. He's like Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman is good in even the, in a bad movie, you know? <laughs> even Loose Cannons? Even in Loose Even cannons, Loose Cannons, you know? Warp Speed. Oh. No, not Warp Speed! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Good. That movie's ter fucking terrible. That movie's fucking terrible. It's terrible, but he's good in it. You know, I mean, you're, you're getting like, you know, and that's Jamani is that way, and you know, maybe even Killian or something like that. You know, great actors that can, you know, maybe Hackman couldn't lift loose cannons out of obscurity and mediocrity, but still, there it is. It's a terrible. <laughs> I remember watching that three in the morning on Cinemax one time. I was like, oh, Dan Aykroyd, he's funny. No, I'm watching, you know. Yeah, you know, you it's it, that movie, like I said, like communism, that movie looks so good on paper. On paper. You watch yes. it, you're like, oh, God, this movie's fucking terrible. It's just I as did. bad as, like, co uh, Collision Course with Pat Morita and Jay Leno. There was yeah, a but, reason that movie was shelved for two years. Isn't it strange? Oh. They said, that, didn't they say that that was Jay Leno's introduction? Like his first movie so, or something? Like he had been on television movie. for years, but they said it was his first movie, but it barely got any kind of if it got I don't even think it got a release. Right. It was just basically. No, it, it just came direct to video. straight to video. Be, well, because D.E.G. Uh, went bankrupt and they couldn't afford to release it. So it sat in the vault for two years before, um, you know, I mean, that, that movie HBO you know, picked it up. I mean, they just sort of like didn't they make a movie called Rush Hour? I mean, <laughs> there you go. And they made three, two successful sequels. Um, so Jeffrey Wright, uh, I, I enjoyed him in the movie. I thought it was a great movie. That was actually a funny movie. I was surprised about that. I mean, Holdovers wasn't really funny for me, you know. And then they called well, Holdovers. At least, you know what? At least American Fiction got best screenplay. That shocked me, but I loved his speech. That was a great speech that the that the screenwriter gave. He said, yeah. "Stop making three hundred million dollar movies. Make like a hundred three million dollar movies or something like that." You know, and that's exactly what we should be doing. And they spend too much money on these movies. And we know why this is all I, I figure out a lot of this. It, it is money laundering to an extent, but it's also salaries that are going into the pockets of executives and they can charge the movie against that. And it's also unions. Unions have this demand. If you're making a union picture, you have to have a minimum of this amount of people and crew and they get paid a lot. And that's why we have these strikes so that they get more salary, you know. Yeah. But um, 
Well, that's why because the team stirs and all the uh, other people they're getting ready to go on strike too. Yeah, yeah. All and have you noticed? And everything. Credits are getting longer and longer. You know, there was a time when not every position on a movie was credited. There were people that were uncredited. They existed uncredited for years. Um, I knew I knew some people who worked on 2001: A Space Odyssey, but they were uncredited. We're talking about 30 or 40 people that were uncredited but worked on the movie. Uh, now, if you look at titles, if you look at the end titles, it's like 10, 15 minutes long, and that's why you get like a lot of interesting title sequences at the end of movies. You know, like Harry yeah. Potter and all the MCU movies. They do they do these things just to keep people to keep them to try and stay in the theater so they can see these names you know so yeah well sorry i'm i unless there, i know there's going to be an end credit scene i don't sit through the end credits a lot of people i remember i forget what it was lemony snicket i was we were watching the lemony snicket movie and we were getting ready to leave but then people stopped and they were like oh look at that and there were like patterns and shapes and animations going on during the credit sequence so i was like okay so we watched, I looked at it for like five seconds, like Clark Griswold looking at the Grand Canyon. So I was like, it's great. Let's go. And then, <laughs> um, all right, moving on to supporting actress. Uh, okay. I, I, I said that divine joy Randolph should win. And I, but then I said, she won't, I thought that they were going to give it to either Emily Blunt because of Oppenheimer, blah, 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 or America. No, no. And it turned out I was wrong no. about that. I was really surprised, uh, because yeah, you were, you dude, you weren't, you weren't doing any tracking of any of the awards dude she swept everything she was like i don't really her and robert downey jr were the sweeps i told you this yeah but that's what like, you do no. you 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 handicap the oscars like a horse race i don't i look at what should win and what will win so i, I thought emily blunt will win or america for her i have to give something to barbie i didn't know they were going to give it to that terrible song uh or they were going to give it to Oppenheimer because everybody's blowing that movie right now. But I did not see Randolph winning because I, I didn't know that there was any, um, that there were any, like, I didn't know holdovers got anything. I thought it was just something that I thought it was well, a respect. You know, she was really good in the holdovers. You know, oh, she's I, wonderful. I really yeah. Her. That's why yeah, I was surprised. She was wonderful in the movie. She so should I get, guess I mean, we could say like what she did to give her. Go ahead. was deserved. Her, I'm sorry. Hers was deserved in your yeah, eyes. Yeah, it was. It was. Okay, there you go. But, you know, I mean, she gets exactly, her performance is exactly what a Best Supporting Actress performance should be. It's it's kind of a diversion, but she is integral at the beginning. She kind of, like, leaves, I guess, uh, like maybe three quarters of the way through the movie when it becomes this road thing. It becomes this road oh, drama. Oh, yeah, right after that. But it's it was, it was an okay, I mean, she was, you know, she was probably the best thing about the movie, if I put it that way. The kid irritated us. <laughs> yeah, kid was a little irritating. I mean, even like, uh, um, what was it? Regan was was watching it. And it's like, God, I hate this kid. And it's like, it's kind of about him. That's going to be a problem for you. So um, we, we moved on to a, a best original screenplay, Anatomy of a Fall, which I, I don't know what this movie's about. I really don't, because this is the I, one movie I haven't seen uh, yet. All I know is it's about. All I know is it's about a woman who is accused of killing her husband. And that's all I know. And it, it's just like it's this movie about a criminal investigation involving her husband. They're trying to say he committed suicide or something like that. And right. They're trying to say she killed him. And I don't know, man. I, I, I'll i check it out one of these days. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to now. It looks I mean, interesting. It, looks, it does look interesting. It looks very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so for adapted screenplay, again, we mentioned American Fiction. Core Jefferson picked that up. And it's also his first movie as director. I did have a comment to make about first movies. They, Hollywood and the industry in general seem really impressed by first movies. The thing is, these kids aren't just picking up 35 millimeter cameras or whatever or and getting $30 million budgets. They've been making movies their whole life, and then they get this opportunity. So I don't really view it as a first film. I view everything they did before as the rehearsal for the big show, and right. this is the big show. I've always seen it that way. They're just really impressed by young people, and the thing is, I think, like, Jonathan Glazer is, he was much older than Cord Jefferson when he made his first film. And his first film was incredible. It was called Sexy Beast from Ben Kingsley. And because of that, he, he has a different outlook on how to tell a story. And he has a different perspective about people. So he's bringing to it a lot of experience living as a human being. Cord Jefferson is a very young man. And 
I think what ho- impressed Hollywood the most was his maturity. So it's weird. Young people are praised for their maturity when mm-hmm. there are plenty of old people out there making films. I mean, um, I was also so like, surprised uh, that he I'll beat out say, Oppenheimer uh, as well. One of the big ones that was won a few years back, uh, Damien Chazelle, when he won for La La Land for Best Director, yeah. he was like <laughs> one of the he was like the youngest director ever to win an Academy Award. And he yeah, already how had he? like how old was he though? I think was he was like, twenty eight. I think he was like twenty eight or twenty nine. He was okay. young. I, uh, I think. I think. Don't don't again. Don't misquote me on this. He he probably could have been in his early thirties for all I know. I mean, the point is, I want to see if he had think. any. If he had any, um, well, he had two movies under experience. his belt. He had, he had this one movie. Oh, he did Whiplash. The Grand, the Grand, yeah, I was gonna say he did the Grand Piano and he did Whiplash. Whiplash was a great movie. I really yeah, enjoyed that, and I thought movie. that should have been a big Oscar winner. I think J.K. got one for it, but um, that was a great film. Uh, I didn't really much care for La La Land. I'm not really big on contemporary musicals. There's only a couple of musicals I really like. One of them is the Music Man, you know that kind of thing, yeah. or Hair, or Grease, or something like that. I'm just yeah, not shop into. Little Shop of Horrors, Rocky Horror Picture Little Shop. Show. Oh man, Little Shop is so awesome. But um, yeah, uh, okay. So he did make most, a my movie most before. Favorite, my most favorite modern musical, like something that came out in the last like 15, 20 years, is either uh, Hairspray or Rock of Ages, both made by the same guy. Funny enough, but uh, those two movies. Hair or Rock Hairspray, of Ages? You I'm dropped out there for a second. Hair or Rock, Rock of Ages? Rock of Ages. Rock of also, Ages Rocky Horror. Horror. I love Rocky Horror. I love all the songs in that. Oh, yeah, who doesn't? Uh, who yeah, he was, I'm, I'm guessing based on this that he was 29 when he made the movie, and he's from Harvard. Of course, he was wearing my Harvard tie. Like, oh, sure, yeah. he went to Harvard. My, hey, Sorry. Hey, my touch. boy's wicked smart, okay? My boy's wicked <laughs> smart. Uh, but Whiplash was a great film. Um. So I mean, like but the rest of these. Unfortunately, like... <laughs> unfortunately, he's going the way of the dodo now because he did that fucking Babylon movie from last year, which was a total fucking misfire. That that I did not see, but yeah, it's been getting terrible. Yeah, 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 there was another. Okay, there's a movie that came out at the same time as Babylon that I kept getting it confused with, and I think it was the oh, David O. Russell film. About that. Yeah, that David O. Russell Amsterdam. That was a really bad movie, and I knew it was going to be Nazis. I knew that this is going to be about Nazis, isn't it? And it turned out, yeah, it was about Nazis. And he has Taylor Swift in it. And I, I just, you know, and after calling Lily Tomlin a cunt, I really don't like him anymore. I, I don't think I, and everybody says he's a terrible man. He's a terrible person and all that. And he screams and yells at his actors and he gets into fist fights with George Clooney. It's just like, shut yeah. the fuck up. Say what you will about James Cameron. The man may be a hothead, but at least he, he gets results out of his movies, and his movies make billions. So He made Kate ones like cry. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh, big anyway. whoop de fucking do. <laughs> whoop de fucking do. Fucking do. Okay, Isn't that James Paxton? Cameron, he can do Isn't whatever that Bill he wants. from Aliens? Didn't yeah. he say that? Yeah, well, whoop de fucking do. That's exactly <laughs> why I said that. Well, whoop de fucking do. Bill Paxton, rest <laughs> in peace. Uh, yeah. Let's move on because the animated and live action stuff, I have no idea what any of this stuff is. Well, the animated, okay, animated I called because I knew Miyazaki was going to fucking win for Boy in the Hair, and I knew that was going to fucking win, and I'm glad it did. No more, you know, corporate Hollywood garbage movies won it this year. It was finally Miyazaki. Yeah, I read that Blue. Elemental was a piece of shit, and yet it gets nominated yeah. for Best Animated but Feature. No, and then dude, okay, Across no, no, the Spider Verse, no, I heard, wasn't good either, you know? Actually, no, no. Across the Spider Verse was the favored movie, believe it or not. Like, okay, you talked about, you know, a movie you wanted to win versus, you know, like the, the hands should, on favorite. Yeah. yeah. Boy and the Heron deserved the award that it got. Fucking amazing movie. I love okay. Boy. Uh, across the Spider Verse, I you know what I didn't. Really I like the first one. I like the first one. First one was I, good. First one was I saw the good, the but... first one was was the best of and really one of the better Spider Man movies. It was just incredible to watch. But this one, no, uh, this is a victim of its own woke politics because they had to create a female superhero again. And it's like we haven't seen enough of these. I, mean, I think Madam Web has destroyed the Spider Man franchise. Yeah. Well, I feel bad for Craven the Hunter when that comes out because now. Oh boy, Sony's got work to do. Yeah, Sony's got fucking work to do. I, All I right, swear so... they can't they can't make a good product unless Marvel's fucking like Marvel is directly involved. 
You know, they have to be directly <laughs> fucking involved to make a good Spider-Man movie these days. I think I, you know, I haven't seen, I didn't see any advertisements from Madam Web though. And I didn't see any. I advertisements. did. I mean, I saw the trailer and everything like that, but dude, here's what I'm saying in the back of my head. I'm like, this is a Sony Spider-Man movie, not mm -hmm. a Marvel Spider-Man movie. It's not going to be good. There's only one movie I saw advertisements for for the entire year. Only one movie. And they kept what, running Oppenheimer over and Barbie. Over. No, just Barbie. Over and over again on TBS. I mainly watch TBS, I guess, because uh, we were trying. Me and my cable provider were trying to find out constructive ways for me to to lower my bill. And they were like, "Well, what channels do you watch frequently?" And I was like, "Well, I watch TBS. I watch Turner Classic. I watch my HBO because I pay for it. <coughs> and I watch um, maybe occasionally during baseball season. I'll watch some baseball games. Uh, but." It was Barbie ads, and there were even Barbie ads in my guide, in my guide, my my program guide. There were Barbie ads. So, and, and well, I, when you're in the case of in the case of TBS, you are, are aware that that's a Warner Brothers owned property, so of course they're going to advertise Barbie shit on their own stage. Advertise, advertise the fuck out of it, even after it made its billion, and we were still seeing yeah. ads, and we were seeing ads a week before the Oscars. They were, they were still showing, and I was just... Now on HBO Max. But I don't know or how Max. much they're spending or what they're spending it on or if they're being taken for a ride by people who charge money for the advertisements. I don't, I don't know what's going on because I'm not seeing that many ads for anything anymore except, I don't know, beer, cars, Pfizer, I, you know, whatever else. Um, hey, can I tell you something? Mexican hey, you beer you that makes I you psychotically angry, you know, that kind of stuff. I would I wouldn't know because I haven't had cable in two years. Hmm. Okay, so brutal honesty. The only reason I was able to watch the Academy Awards this year, so I ended up getting uh, sick again Oscar night. Like I was gonna go to work that day. I told everybody, okay, I want to watch the Oscars at six o'clock, and they were also, yeah, you can mm -hmm. watch the Oscars. Good. Mm -hmm. Well, I got sick and I didn't want to go, so I stayed home. Well, unfortunately, Oscars was not streaming anywhere except YouTube TV. Gotcha. So what did I do? Yeah, that's I got uh, a three. I got a I got a three week free trial to YouTube TV just so I could fucking watch. Just so you could watch the, yeah, my, so uh, watch the Oscars. Yeah, my my mother in law had an interesting story because she said that her cable provider did not have a contract with ABC anymore, so she had to watch it the same way you watched it, and she watched it on a damn cell phone. Because she doesn't know how to, I guess, connect the uh, the the device to the TV. Because you can connect it. Because I remember um, when YouTube TV was first announced, it was like you just you can you can um, you can uh, what do you call it? Cast it to your television. Yeah. Oh, you want to hear you want to hear a dumb one while I'm on a tangent though. This is funny as fuck. You cannot cast the Max app to any Roku TV. Yeah, I've I've noticed that because I have for some reason I have uh with my HBO subscription I have Max, but I can't get it on my TV. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean no because what the fuck is that horseshit? The only thing the only thing apparently that it uh, supports is Chromecast. What you can do though is because my computer has casting ability, I can cast the image from my computer to my TV. Well, well yeah, that, that's, that's about the that's best I can. Yeah, that's about the best. Like, like I'm saying, like, like if I have or I can run if I want to, I can I can run an HDMI cable to my TV, and have it operate right. that. Way. Well, if I were to go to my job right now, we have a Roku TV at work, so like I could pull up all my apps like Hulu. I could cast to the TV at work, like Netflix, freaking Peacock, Tubi, all this Paramount Plus. I could cast from my phone to the TV. HP or Max? Nope, it's not Chromecast. We don't support Roku. Fuck you. Hmm. That's uh, terrible. Yeah, well, that's that's, terrible. that's that's the that's the plight of streaming services, and they're going to take over completely <laughs> one day. Every every company will have their own streaming service. Uh, all right, let's before I I want to get to the uh, the music. Um, Ludwig Göransson's score for Oppenheimer well, is basically it's just Hans Zimmer again, and it's all uh, for this one. Uh, it's okay. I just for sheer audacity, I would give it to Poor Things because that music is absolutely out of its mind. And I was watching, and I was like, "What is this Chinese music torture?" <laughs> That's what I was yeah. calling it. Um, 
but also I thought maybe, even though, I mean, it's obvious he doesn't work as much as he used to. And, and a lot of this was a conglomeration, uh, John Williams, just, just for, just for, you know, how many years of, of for a middle 50? of the road, for a middle of for, the road, for, Indiana Jones movie. No, thanks. Yeah. But, but 50 years of, of just being an icon, he should have gotten it one more time. He's been, he's been, he's won it. Yeah. Uh, other scores are not, I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon, the score was interesting. I found the score interesting. It was better than Oppenheimer. American well, Fiction, that would have been nice to see. Today. It would have been nice to see Robbie Robertson get yeah, it. Yeah, Robbie a, Robertson. Honorary Oscar. It would have been nice to have gotten that. You know, Robbie Robertson is like kind of like unsung because he doesn't go out there and really make a big deal about it because, you know, I mean, he was a, he was, he was a guitarist in the band and the band is a very influential band, but a lot of people don't know about it, you know, and a lot of people weren't fans because they didn't know about it, but they're basically Bob Dylan's backup band and they became their own thing. And they toured with Dylan and I have a couple of records and I really do enjoy it. And there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of songs out there that you, that a lot of people wouldn't realize are, are from the band. Kind of like three dog night. You hear a lot of songs for that and you're like, Oh, uh, and then you, you're surprised that it's three dog night. Um, but uh, yeah, they give it to Oppenheimer. It's just it's kind of unimaginative because it just sounds like every score from a Nolan film now. Mm-hmm. And then well, the next, I mean, look at it's <clears throat> a, dude. It's like on the technical side, it was like literally poor things in Oppenheimer. They got all the technical this year. I guess I was so surprised though that that Barbie didn't get anything for production design, and that was just they well, actually I'm made so, the movie I'm look like a toy. Things, they made it look like a living live action toy, and I was I was really impressed by that. That was the one thing I was impressed of with Barbie. But poor I'm things gets it, which I think. Things... Go ahead, go ahead. I said I'm very glad that poor things got makeup. I'm extremely happy that movie got makeup because it deserved it. I everyone I'm glad everyone was saying it should have gotten makeup anyway, right? But I was yeah. impressed by how old they made Robert Downey Jr. look in Oppenheimer, and I was impressed with uh, what was the other, the other thing, uh, Maestro. I I like the old age makeup and and also Carrie Mulligan's cancer makeup and Maestro. It looked really accurate. They're doing incredible things now. Uh, as a result, I guess of Nutty Professor and um, what was the other one? Thinner. Remember when Thinner came out? Everybody yep. was impressed by that, and, and they get a nomination for makeup. But they managed to integrate, you know, uh, prosthetics with computers, and they're doing a lot more realistic stuff now. Because if you look at old age makeup back from the past, it doesn't look as great. Um, unless, unless Dick Smith did it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dick Smith and 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 Rick Baker, Rick, but Rick Baker is one of those guys well, who Rick, did that with Nutty Rick Professor. Baker, Rick Baker worked under Dick Smith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you got to remember, Dick Smith was God. Okay, like when it came to makeup, he started it all. He did it the best. He laid the blueprints for all modern makeup artists. Okay, well, the like, best. You got to remember the 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 makeup from uh, the what you call it, the Dustin Hoffman movie. Uh, what? The one where he had, uh, oh, the the where, where he's an old man at the end. It's an old man, Dustin Hoffman, old man, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, it, it's a Dustin Hoffman movie, and he plays an old man at the end. I can never remember the name of that movie because I, <laughs> I, I just I, all I'm thinking of is Tootsie, and I know it's not Tootsie. <laughs> right, it's not that, but it's like. Oh, it's also, just, uh, there was uh, Mumbles. Remember, he was Mumbles in Dick Tracy. Yeah, he was Mumbles in Dick Tracy. I'm gonna look up the name of that movie, but I can't remember it right now. But you have that makeup, then you have. The old it's age probably going to be something I should have known. Yeah. And then you yeah. have the old age makeup on Max von Sydow for freaking Exorcist, and just the, the makeup on Exorcist in general. They did a they did so, a decent job. The only thing the thing that they never get right though is I don't know weight. They never, but they did a fine job with with Maestro, and they did a fine job because I have a feeling that Robert Downey Jr. is going to look like that when he gets to be that age. Uh, if it looks like that person is going to look that way in old age that's a good makeup job um but poor things got it for the audacity again it was just you know Willem Dafoe has this weird cut up lasagna face little bit little big man little big man was the name of the uh, Hoffman movie oh okay little big man I know I don't think I've ever seen that one um okay so uh we have to talk about the travesty that was Billie Eilish I don't know why she won when I you know I'm not a fan of Barbie. I'm not a fan of I'm just Ken. And I think that Diane Warren should never win an Oscar ever. Um, the, it's, they, 
Billy Eilish, I've never okay. Maybe it's just because I'm an old man or something, but I just don't it's see the appeal. An, it's because you're an old man, and it's because I'm an old man because I don't care for Billy Eilish that much either. Then Although, my daughter, my daughter is an old man too because she's 17. She's the direct demographic, and she hates Billy Eilish. So, and she's not a fan of Billy. No Eilish. time to die was a good song. No time to die was good. No, was it wasn't. You know, like it was the same thing over and over again, which is. Eba, 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 eba. That's all she does in every fucking song. It's just like. You know, they got Gosling. They even integrated him being at the Oscars with a performance of I'm Just Ken. And what's more, it is a showstopper. I can't, I, I made sure to watch that in the movie, and it was a big showstopper. It wasn't this horse shit. What was it made for? It's like, fuck you. You're a doll. Okay. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, like, Billy, I just don't, every song, to, it all sounds like the same crap. Stop it. <laughs> Little. Sorry, my cat is attacking the cat. cat. Let off! I'm gonna go. Hang on a second. I have to kick this cat's butt. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Fucking cats! I swear, they're terrible. For I don't know how long we've had. How long have we had sushi since 2016? 2015, 2016. And for nine years, Little has just been trying to rape her. Oh, jeez. <laughs> he's just Bad such a... Kitty. But he doesn't know what he's doing, because we had him fixed at an early age, so he just, he just hovers on top of her and bites her neck, and he doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's just... God. Anyway, okay. So... Uh, they have a nice show stopping uh, and, and after we're done with the with the winners and everything, we can talk quickly about the show and as a whole. I knew Zone of Interest was going to I said Zone of Interest has to win. This is what the movie's about. The movie is about sound and it's and it was and, and the sound was was incredible. And it was all, all it was all part of the whole thing. They had to give it to the Zone of Interest for that reason. Um, well, I'm glad you called that one. I'm glad I'm glad that one came out for you. It's just I didn't think that because there's a lot of like as I as I told you in the previous episode there's a lot of anti-Semitic sentiment going on right now, and but the thing is I guess if Glazer is wearing a button that says uh, self-hating Jew it's okay for the it's okay for the movie to win. I don't know what is uh, what um what does your wife think about that? She's our resident Jew. Yeah, she doesn't care. She doesn't care, so she's apolitical about I mean, that. Okay, but, well, I mean, not. Let's just say this: when it comes to movies, she doesn't care. Hmm. Okay, because so she's, she's probably like, like what what we're talking about right now. She's oblivious to it's like she we can't have deep discussions about movies and what should have won, what, you know, what should have lost, that kind of so stuff. So she's probably I got mean, the smartest take on the whole thing. Just leave it alone and let everybody kill each other basically <laughs> if you I let everybody kill that, each other then but... we don't have to then we don't have to deal with this anymore just everybody I mean, who's her, filled her with cousin, hate probably die. her cousin did a little instagram thing about talking about what's going on in hamas right now with you know and i'm like okay great you know it's like sorry i'm not political like that i don't go on my insta or my facebook and start doing political stuff i mean yes i i put my little thing up yesterday about the inhaler but that's just more or less a good thing it's like you know what like, the thing is i'm irish and i don't even have an opinion on the ira you know i think we have way too many problems in this country way too the many only thing i gotta here. say is this who hey all i gotta say is this who let that ira fuck into my bar <laughs> <laughs> uh okay so Moving on to production design. Again, Poor Things gets it for production design and set decoration. Uh, that's the one Oscar that I think Barbie should have gotten. Napoleon, I mean, but the thing about it is a lot of this stuff is done in computers now. I mean, how much of it is actually done with hands-on stuff going on? But um, Killers of the Flower Moon, I would say, was probably not done with computers. And Jack Fisk is one of the great production designers from back in the day. Sissy Spacek's um, husband. And he he designed movies for David Lynch. He designed movies for Brian De Palma, uh, for Terrence Malick. The guy is brilliant. Um, Napoleon looks like a movie that was com created almost completely inside a computer. It does not Probably. look. I mean, and it's just so murky, too. And I know 
Ridley Scott is a, a brilliant director, but you lost me at Joaquin Phoenix. That was just the most ridiculous casting. He should have cast an actual actor from France or something like that. But he probably couldn't I, get yeah. financing unless he had Joaquin in it, you know? I guess not. I mean, I was never that's, going to that's see the, Napoleon anyway. I, I could care less about, about that stuff. I really could care less. I would have wanted and to see And besides, the movie I heard Kubrick's was not Napoleon. even all that great anyway. I said the, I heard uh, the movie wasn't even all that great anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would rather have wanted to see Stanley Kubrick's version of Napoleon back from the '70s that he was wanting to make. But um, hell, I want to. I want to see Martin Weir's version of Napoleon from Get Shorty. Yeah, <laughs> I'd rather watch that one. Um, but uh, okay, so we move on to cinematography, and again, Oppenheimer gets it, and it's just like, hey, you're shooting conversations in rooms at tables and stuff, and there's a couple of scenes where they're outside looking at a bomb. I don't think it 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 deserved it. I think it should have been poor things because poor things. I mean, so much was put into the image. And, you know, my daughter was like complaining about it. She said, "I don't like the colors, and it's got this computery feel about it." But I feel like a lot more work was done than was done with Oppenheimer. But Oppenheimer, I think it was a political one. They didn't have to give it to Oppenheimer. It was political because of film. Oppenheimer is one of the few movies that was actually shot on film that were nominated right. for Oscars this year. So they were obviously Same this was a poor things was a, shot on film as well. I don't know that poor things was. It, it was, doesn't have. It was. Let me um let me just quickly take a look and see because it looked like it was shot for me. It looked like it was shot on a um. The reason it looks, like Genesis it, was shot like it, it looks like that because it, well, a lot of it was green screen, a lot of it was composite work. There was a lot of composite work done on that movie. It looks a little too crisp, you know. It, it's lacking some of the characteristics of film. But let me let me check the uh, technicals if there are any. If there are any technical, would notes. be on IMDb. I think it would tell you if it was shot on film or digital. Yeah, let's see. Details. Technical. Uh, Aricam ST, Aricam LT, Aricam. It was shot on like seven different cameras. A couple yeah. of these are, a couple of these are digital, but there is one film camera in here. Uh, the Aeroflex 765 and the Aeroflex 416 are both film cameras. The, it was also angle? shot on a Beaumont Vista Vision camera from that the the Beaumont Vista Vision camera wasn't that made in the in the fifties, so it was shot on on, on an older camera too. But there are two digital cameras that they also use, so they probably integrated some some of the film work with the digital, and that's probably what I was seeing. Yeah, this one, two, three, four, five, six six cameras were used, and two of them were digital, but the other four were film. No, wait. The lights, some Omicron are? I think that's a ditch. Okay. So it's like half and half. Probably because of those weird visual effects they were doing with the production design. Because it felt like a lot of this was way too vivid. You know, and that's one of my central complaints with, with all the digital technology now. Is that there's no room for the nuance of film. Like, you look at, like, for me, okay, this is, this is where I stand. Death Proof is beautifully shot. The of course it is, because... Yeah, it's beautifully it shot, and it looks like a movie that was... I mean, it actually looks like a movie that was shot in the early 70s. It has the look of a movie. It Because I don't know what he was doing. I don't know if he used an older film stock or had an older film stock being used. This is what the Holdovers was trying to do and failed miserably because it just didn't look like that, you know? I don't know why the Holdovers... Yeah, because that was shot that. Cause that was shot digital, and it had and it had a filmic look to it, kind of like what uh, Rodriguez did on, uh, on Planet Terror. yeah. But even Planet Terror, they 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 did so much to I don't know make it look like like it had been shown so many times in a movie theater that there was film damage or something. They oh they, right, that was at the beginning of that whole digital thing of trying to make something look more like film, right? <coughs> Pretty much. I mean, Lucas started digital. I mean, it was like I'm not going to say he invented the fucking format. Of course he didn't. But he yeah. was like the first filmmaker. He was the first big filmmaker to start shooting on digital and he was the guy who convinced all the other filmmakers start shooting on digital it's the wave of the future you know faster editing you were you telling me quicker. you were telling me before that lucas doesn't like grain and you said that he doesn't like grain and that's why we're seeing that's, these that's new restorations that, that, 
Yeah. I but mean, Grain, Cameron's, Grain Cameron is, is just as bad. Have you have you heard the new things about like the Abyss, True Lies, and Aliens? Like what's been going on with those? I hope. What is he gonna do? Is he gonna take all the grain oh, no, out of those movies? He he did. He, he it's not. He's gonna. He he fucking did. I mean, see that that's not fair. They should not be doing that. We want, you know, I didn't, when I want to see, I want to see The Abyss, I want to see the special edition on Blu-ray, right? I want to see what I saw, not not an improvement, quote-unquote. I hate improvements. Well, they said the, only... the Abyss is, The Abyss looks the best out of the three because there, there really wasn't a lot of grain there to begin with because of the type of cameras that were used and the type of photography. Yeah. So when it came to, like, a 4K restoration... That is the best looking one. Granted, yes, it's going to be a little divisive, but that's the best looking one. Aliens, they said, looks pretty good. Aliens was shot on shitty film stock anyway, so that one I give it a pass. If you want to do some noise reduction, okay. That film was too noisy. In. The only but improvement then, tr- I, I approve true lies, of. True Lies just, just shit to bed. True Lies, they said, was oh, man. the fact that it was shot on Super 35, the fact that, you know, you needed film grain there, and then he took the film grain away. And... That's 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 a letdown. The only the only improvement I ever approved of was when Lucas, because uh, when Attack of the Clones came out, it looked terrible, because it was like the first the first attempt by a, a wholly uh, a digital or HD production that he had then converted to film. Then he went and made a, a DVD uh, um, of it. And it looked really terrible. But then he cleaned it up and restored it or remastered it or made it look better. I don't know what he went back to. He went back to the original. What movie was this again? Attack of the Clones. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? Because actually that was shot on digital. That was the first one. That was shot on digital. Yes. And then it was. And it was a a murky mess. It looked like shit. It looked terrible. Yeah. But then you look go back to uh, what you call it. Uh. The first one, Phantom Menace, that was completely shot on film, but then when he went to and did it for uh, for Blu-ray, he completely degrained it, made it look like it was shot on digital. It looks like fucking. It did shit. look a lot, yeah. It did look a lot cleaner. But I prefer the Blu-ray set to the DVD set. I gave the DVD set away to a friend, and I kept. I still I still hold on to the DVDs because I'm a Star Wars collector. I mean, mm. dude, and also best, I okay, didn't the like best looking Star Wars movie is Revenge of the Sith. Like that one looks the best out of out of the original six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Save for the new one. That's but like I have to also say I, I I preferred when they I don't know why, but they had a puppet of Yoda in poor in and poor things. Yeah, <laughs> they had a puppet of Yoda in that. <laughs> um they they had a, a really bad puppet of Yoda in Phantom Menace and he replaced it with a digital and it looked better. It just looked a little bit better, that's all. Um Okay, so uh, finishing anyway. up with uh, makeup and hairstyling, of course, we knew it was going to get poor things. poor things. But again, shocked that Barbie wasn't even nominated for that. Um, Maestro also was really quite well done. Uh, costume design also goes to poor things. Poor things won how many Oscars total? Four? Four or five. Four or five. Four or five. Yeah, so, like- it's it's uh there's uh yeah, it's interesting. Barbie didn't get costume design either. Um and then finally, film editing, which is a category that should be – i this is controversial for you, I'm sure. But film editing should be taken away. It should be taken off the nominee thing because no one knows how to properly edit a film anymore. The point of editing a film is to take all that footage and throw out 30% of it that you've shot and keep cool. keep the other 70% as the movie. You have to tell a story. It isn't just images and music, and that, unfortunately, is what Oppenheimer is to me. Just this constant thing. If you want to go for the shortest, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume, I haven't seen it, but I'm going to assume that Anatomy of a Fall is probably the shortest movie in this list. Editing is about taking the best and discarding the rest. And Thelma Schumacher was one of the great editors. Taxi Driver is a movie that is about an hour and 40 something odd minutes and she edited it and it was like an incredible after hours as well a little over 90 minutes uh, the longest movie she had ever done back in the day was probably Raging Bull which is a little over two hours uh, that was classic Scorsese period but it is such a dense incredible two hours that is what an editor is supposed to do I don't know why they decided to have three and a half hours 
And it's not, I mean, people are really busy these days. You think movies would get shorter, you know? The, the, the only movies that were reserved for three hours were big sky epics back in the day. Like, for instance, I have Out of Africa on the on the uh, DVR, and I have to figure out a day we can watch it because it's over three, uh, nearly over three hours long. And it was a big epic movie. Those were the kind of, Gandhi, those were the kind of movies that got three-hour running times back in the day. Yeah. Nothing happens in this movie. And it doesn't happen for three and a half hours. Like, I think three things happen total. <coughs> it, when it when we're talking about, you know, conflict, we're talking about the narrative, we're talking about the tension. This movie could have been, at like, I don't know, 90 minutes. You could have taken it and made, made something really incredible. Except that now people would complain. Minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll split the diff with you and I'll say maybe two and a half hours. Could've I just, lost, but there's so much... You could have – the best parts of the movie was the last five minutes, and I stick by that. I said that last time. I love the little radio show, and I love the final shot. And that was probably the best photography of, of all of it right there. And Rodrigo Prieto is a great – he's a great cinematographer. Um, oh, and finally, I forgot. Uh, best visual effects. Godzilla minus one. I really yes. wanted to see that. I can probably – I wanted I to see that. That was that was one of the best wins of the night. Godzilla finally got a fucking Oscar. It's a fifteen million dollar movie. It's a fifteen million dollar movie, which proves to me that a lot of what we do in the in this country is money laundering. I swear. He made a Godzilla movie, and it looked based on the visual effects. The vi oh my god! Remember the Emmerich, Remember Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin's Godzilla? Yeah. And how much that yeah. cost, <laughs> and what it looked like eventually. Yeah. See, there are problems here. Uh, Peter Jackson, I mean, he managed to create incredible visual effects for a very low budget with the first three Lord of the Rings movies. You know, and, and it's because they're not working here. It, for some reason, it costs too much money to make movies here. But, well, just like it costs too much. Well, just like I'm a Godzilla guy. I love Godzilla. It costs too much money to make cars here. It costs too much money to make cars here. It costs too much money to make electronics here. It costs too much money to do everything fucking here. That's yeah. why you outsourced everything. And we're a nation of consumers now. We just buy products. We don't create anything. And when we do, it costs too much money. Try buying a T-shirt that's made in the United States. It'll, it'll... I'll, I'll tell you, spe <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of the whole made in China thing, I'll tell you, one movie that should have been on the short list this year that, got, that did not get any nominations, one of the best movies this year, I've watched it twice, fucking Blackberry. Okay, Blackberry. That is an amazing, amazing <clears throat> film. I love it. Everything about that movie. I watched it a second time. It's better the second time around. I could watch it a third, fourth, and fifth time. I think it's great. It has amazing acting. It has a great, fun story. Yes, the movie clocks in at a little over two hours. Oh, another movie that got shorter this year, Air, the movie about the Air Jordans. Uh, oh, yeah, those really are, good yeah, we, we talked, so we two talked really a little good bit. Movies. When we did our Kiss special, we talked about the, the advent of the corporate biography. And we think it started with uh, what the social me the social network or something was it that right something along those lines and then you know you talked about the founder of course we talked about Neil because right. we were talking about the Neil Bogart movie uh, success stories or whatever you know contemporary stuff but you're you're coming along recommending Blackberry again I'm gonna have to go ahead and look for that and maybe see if we can't find it and watch it, it. it's on it's on Hulu yeah if you and, have Hulu it's on Hulu. But you could also sail the high seas, as it were. You uh, could sail the high seas. Yarr. So let's uh, let's wrap it up by uh, just uh, talking about the show. Uh, as I said, Jimmy Kimmel needs to go. He's not funny. I wasn't laughing at all. I don't think I laughed. Um, he, what's more, he also alienated and disenfranchised half of the of the voting public with his stupid little jokes. The best parts, okay, the best parts of this, I would say. I, I don't even think I was laughing when John Cena came out, quote unquote, naked. Um, the best parts that were was probably one of the highlights. That was one of the highlights, though. I wasn't laughing. I was like, I, don't know. I think it was humiliation. I think they were trying to publicly humiliate John Cena. How about Arno How about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito? Arnold and Danny was good. Uh, Michael Keaton's Batman only dealt with Danny. And he dealt with him twice, oh, actually. He dealt with him twice. He dealt with him once in Batman Returns and the other time in Johnny Dangerously. Uh, and go. that was a nice little uh, wink. He doesn't know anything from Arnold. That was George Clooney. And Clooney was Clooney even there? I don't even think he was there. No, was he? I don't think he was there. Um, okay, so 
that that was that was cute. Uh, the best part, though, for me was John Mulaney breaking down Field of Dreams. And that's why, John Mulaney, we have to start a letter writing campaign because I watched one of his uh, stand up shows. Regan is a fan of John Mulaney. She loves him. Um, we watched the show, uh, one of his Netflix specials. Uh, I forgot what it was called. Uh, New in Town. That's what it was. And it was hilarious. The guy is really funny. And uh, he's a young man. And uh, he. He channels, he's, he kind of reminds me of if George Carlin and Jerry Seinfeld had a baby. That's sort of like that, you know? He's like doing Too bad Mulaney, Mulaney, unlike Seinfeld, couldn't have a successful TV show. Yeah, that's, you know why? Because it was basically just a Seinfeld knockoff. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to rip off Seinfeld rather than, I don't know, have Mulaney really involved in the writing and, and actually doing his his thing and also just just having fun. We need to start a letter writing campaign and get him on the show. Uh, okay, now the immemorium I had really serious issues with. I don't know why, but they don't want us to know who died. The camera was so far away from the screen that showed all the dead people that you have no idea what's going on. And then at the end, they give up and just put a whole list of people. Yeah, that was kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't Even accuse us of not was, forgetting. We didn't correct. forget. They're all here. <laughs> that was correct. Okay, how about this? How about the failed attempt they did? They tried it 16 years ago, and they did it again by having prior Oscar winners come up on stage to talk that about. That was really, oh, yeah, God. Can I just I say that. also? Go ahead, go ahead. So I hate that. They did that, uh, they did that back in 2008, and it just drug the show on too much longer. You know, I'd rather two people get up on stage, make a couple of jokes, read off the nominees, and hand them the Oscar. Okay, I'm going to give a little history lesson for everybody out there. When I was a kid, and probably up until maybe 15 years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something, they used to show clips from the movies. They used to right. give you a clip from a movie. They used to say, this clip is the 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 exemplar of the movie's excellence. They would show you a scene from the movie, just a scene from the movie for best picture, and then a scene spotlighting the actor and the actress and the supporting actor and the supporting actress. That's what they used to do for, uh, for the five nominees. That's picture and actors and actresses, right? And now yep. they've taken that away. They've taken that away, and instead they have, like, well, this, this was that was really boring. I hated the actors coming up and saying, you know, Jeffrey, you were so awesome in this movie, and damn it. I mean, I feel like they didn't see the movies. I feel like all the people that were up there had no idea about the the nominees or the movies until they got the list and had to do their little tribute. I really feel like none of these people watched American Fiction or Oppenheimer or Killers of the Flower Moon or Poor Things or Anatomy of Fall or Zone of Interest. I feel like none of them watched any of these movies because they're actors. I mean, actors are there to do their job. They don't really... Look at Dakota Johnson. <laughs> what did she say about about Madam Web? She's like, I, I never saw I didn't watch the movie, so I don't know what face I'm making in it. I mean, those are hilarious. It's hilarious to see these uh, people. Oh, and then also I love hearing when um I forget who it was. There was an actress who was like, uh, I don't I don't like superhero movies, I don't like comic book movies. I just took the job, you know. <laughs> I love hearing that too in interviews. <laughs> it's uh, but um yeah, actors tend to be clueless. They tend to be terrible being narcissistic you know d pornographers that's this is how they are child molesters they're everything ricky gervais says they are and ricky gervais he should co-host the show with john mulaney get those two Please guys up on the oh, stage God, i no. guarantee you people will watch it it will get it will get huge ratings there's only one reason the ratings were a little bit up the previous year and it's because they wanted to see if there was going to be a replay of the chris rock incident because people were not watching and then suddenly started people started watching as soon as chris rock hit or i'm sorry will smith hit uh chris rock they want to see that kind of stuff because it's so boring otherwise you know uh but that's my take what do you think uh, yeah i agree <laughs> Everyone wanted to see another incident like they did the year before, so that's why the ratings were up. I mean, there really wasn't a reason a lot of people were watching last year other than the controversy that was caused the year before. Mm. 
The only one of the my highlights of the night watching Steven Spielberg give Chris Nolan his Oscar. That was a uh, that was worth seeing. I know your opinion on Oppenheimer is what it is, but it was cool seeing you know the old guard handing it off to the new guard. Well, you know they no they do that because it's a kind of a double bluff. Uh, we assumed if Spielberg was going to go up, then the fix was in for Zone of Interest because Spielberg went on record saying this was the greatest Holocaust movie I'd ever seen. Um, just like we thought that The Fugitive was going to win in 1994 or 1995 because Harrison Ford was up there to present the Oscar. We thought he was going to give it to, uh, we thought he was going to give it to The Fugitive, but it wound up being Schindler's List. So we had a nice little reunion of Spielberg and Harrison Ford there. So yep. sometimes they put these things up there and say, oh my God, oh my God, is Zone of Interest going to win? Because that's what we were all thinking. There was that one time well, like I remember. Well, like they did last year, Her Harrison Oh, sorry. Harrison Ford got up there for everything everywhere just so he could give Kihue Kwan a hug. Um, also, uh, they had one where a best director, uh, they had Scorsese, George Lucas, yep. Francis Ford Coppola, and Steven Spielberg, all, and Brian De Palma. Was he there too? I don't know. No, De Palma no, no, probably no, no, wasn't no. there. He's a all famous was, Oscar hater. It, hold on. All it was was Spielberg, Lucas, and uh, Coppola, Coppola yeah. handing it off to Scorsese. Right, right. And they said, We're, we've all won Oscars. And Lucas is like, I've never won an Oscar. And they're like, oh, okay. I've been nominated a couple of times. Well, I'd like to say it's better to give than receive. No, it's not. Mm. God, you got the I whole script memorized. Party goes, of course, because that's one of my favorite Oscar speeches of all time. When Scorsese says he finally won. Come on, dude. That's like my yeah. favorite Oscar moment of all time. Was that The Departed? Yes. Yes, okay. It was The Departed. All right. Uh, great movie. Not his best, but great. Uh, okay, finally, uh, Al Pacino. <laughs> oh, God. Someone needs to let him back in the nursing home. No, you know, oh, you, like, okay, I just want to let you know. <laughs> I screwed a 20-year-old and I've got a little baby, okay? <laughs> and she got a great ass. Um, <laughs> now, wasn't he supposed to read off the nominees first? Because he so just I'm goes sold. up there and says, and the winner is Oppenheimer. We all know it. I want to go home. <laughs> he just goes up there and says, fuck it, give me a beer. Uh, he <laughs> said, fuck it, give me a beer. I'm done. Oh, my God. That was just like, I was, what the fuck, we were, buddy? It, it, no, because, okay, more than a few people commented on this, and they said, La La Land? Is this another La La Land? Because the winner was supposed to be Moonlight, but it wound up being La La Land. I don't even, did he even open the envelope? Oh. <laughs> yes, he did. He did open the envelope. I was worried too, but I do. We already knew Oppenheimer was gonna fucking win everything. It was no fucking surprise there, dude. It would have been more shocking if he said anything else other than fucking Oppenheimer. Okay. Oh, what if he did though? What if he was like, um, the Oscar goes to? Well, no, Anatomy of a Fall. <laughs> he just yells out, <laughs> Anatomy of a Fall, and then everybody's like, huh? But they have huh? to applaud because they can't act like anything went wrong. So they have to be, uh, okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> poor Al. Poor, poor Al. Uh, one of our hey, poor Al. Man, that guy's he's still old. banging, he's he's still banging 25-year-old supermodels and making babies with them. So God bless Al Pacino and his mocha chino and his cappuccino. And his donkey <laughs> Say hello to my chocolate blend. Oh, God. <laughs> and that... Oscars 2024, 96 years of movie excellence. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to come back, I guess. This is the fifth season of Upstairs at Freelix. Are we doing Hammer movies? Oh, boy. I gotta. That's going to be fun. I got to find half these damn movies that you want me to watch. Um, you can find them. I, I guarantee you'll be able to find them. Uh, well, but some for, of these well, I for have the on Laserdisc. You know, some of them I have on Laserdisc. Some of them I have on Blu-ray somewhere around here. Uh, All right, let's. Uh, let me are gonna have to be get found on streaming. From... Um, the first movie that we're going to look at, I guess, is going to be The Curse of Frankenstein from 1957. So, ah, if you want to have, which I have in front of me, I believe, or it's okay. in the side room. Do you also have Dracula 1958 and The Mummy 1959? I think I have all those. Okay, then we can do we could just make our first episode those three movies. Those are the beginning yeah, gotta, of Hammer. I just got to find uh I just got to find a couple of them. Like I know where my Curse of Frankenstein is and 
I have one of those Hammer Horror collections that has the mummy and it has Dracula in it. Mm -hmm. I just got to fucking, I got to find where I stash that and open it. All right, and then we'll, remember, we'll dude, meet I have back more, here. I have more Blu-rays. I have more movies than anybody, and it and I have movies stashed in every crevice of my house. So it's just it's a bitch to find them sometimes. I've got like I've got I'm looking at an entire enormous bookcase full of movies and another bookcase full of Blu-rays, and then I have a whole bunch of stuff in the computer. Um, so our next episode, we'll be doing the first three of those Hammer movies there, and uh, we'll we'll talk about that. But uh, for now, um, I'm David Lawler, and this has been uh, Mr. Freilich over here in uh, Illinois. <laughs> and oh, yeah. Send all hate mail to John Freilich. Uh, <laughs> no, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> oh, and please I've been getting don't. some hate mail, too, myself. Suddenly, people have been coming out of the woodwork and telling me I suck, my work and everything. Uh, anyway, uh, good night. Good night. Like, share, and subscribe.